Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week we'll find out what they think about their observations of the health of the economy, what their friends are saying, where the pain is, what have they seen recently, are there any patterns? My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Good afternoon, Miles. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Good to have you back. Hi, Cam. How are you today? Oh, box of fluffies, as usual. Now, tell me, Miles, you're in retail. What I think I'll do is I'll ask each of the buddies tonight how they think the economy is going. As I said, you're in retail, so you'll be at the sharp end of the stick. Yep. Uh, retail sure is the sharp end, and it's very difficult out there at the moment. So, you know, people have shut their wallets. People have decided that they have to calm down, back off. People haven't got any confidence, and they're not spending as a result of that. So is it general malaise, or is there something specific you can put your finger on? Well, I kind of think it's a combination of quite a few things happening. August typically is a cold and miserable month, and um, winter is never a good time for retail. I also think that there's been a lot of um, change recently. The government has decided finally to do something with the massive spending, and they have cut their spending, and you could argue it's not enough. Or you could argue that it's causing too much pain. And I think the most important thing that I notice is that mortgage interest rates have risen significantly. And once mortgage interest rates rise significantly, people have a lot less free cash in their wallets. And I think that people are hurting. And I, one of the things I was thinking about was the number of for sale signs on houses that I've seen. And... That's a telling thing that you can just observe in your own local street. How many houses are for sale? And really, it's people are hurting. I've heard that uh, some banks are saying to people with the, when the interest rates go up, they go and talk to their bank and they say, look, can we go to interest only? And the banks are saying to them, sure, you can go interest only, but you have to put your house on the market. Yep, I think the banks are playing hardball. Hmm. Well, they always get paid, don't they? Always. Funny that. I was also uh, talking to my brother, and he's in farming, and he said that he has basically stopped spending. But the one bright spot on his future uh, sales is that the beef price has gone through the roof. And and he, he is basically thanking God that the beef price is up because he'll be able to sell his big beefies and that'll mean it'll get him out of a really tough patch. Yeah, things must be pretty tough, though, because the Reserve Bank is, has finally dropped the official cash rate. They must be seeing the contraction in the economy and realise that the in, you know the increasing interest rates that they've you know, basically had several years of hammering us with um, have led to a constriction in the economy. We need to have more money back in the economy, but I'm not seeing the interest rates flow on particularly quickly to the banks. You know, I haven't seen great big campaigns where they're saying that they've reduced their rates. It looks like they're milking it for as long as they can. Yeah, I was just about to say, I think that um, the banks have missed out on that message. But I think the other thing is that there's quite a bit of a a, um, trader mentality amongst people that I know. And, you know, I, I trade people for meat, and fish and um, other items that I trade. And I think it's actually quite a comment that people are now saying, oh, yeah, hey, uh, do you want some sausages? I've got some fish. What have you got? And uh, they're not actually relying on it because, let me be quite frank, with the price of snapper fillets in the supermarket, absolutely outrageous. They're eye-wateringly expensive. The only way I can afford snapper is to catch it myself or to trade it with someone who has bought it. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? You know, you go to the supermarket, you buy, you know, one of those, 
basically fill up one of those little bags that they sell for a dollar, you know, at the supermarket. And then you find out your bill's like 80 or $90, even over $100 for a, a very small bag of, of goodies that, you know, normally you would have in the past bought for 30 or $40, but now it's, it's up near approaching 100 And if you go in you know, a family of four and, and do a bit of a shop, you know, I know that in my family we used to feed the family of four on $200 a week. That would be impossible to do now with the prices of things. You're quite right. It is impossible, and I find that in uh, our supermarket shopping, we have to think very carefully about the treats, and it's the basics that are in the basket first, and the treats, well, you know what? Sometimes we just do without. I mean, in what reality, apart from the one we're living in, is 20 bucks for a block of cheese sensible? I mean, we've got cattle um, and, and cows up the wazoo, we keep getting told by the Greens we've got too many of them, and yet we've got you know basic products that are exorbitant, even butter. I mean, you get a 500-gram thing of butter, and it's like $7.50. Uh, it, it, it's eye-watering. It is eye-watering, and it's outrageous. And I just don't buy the poppycock that Fonterra has uh, sold us about cheese, butter, and milk. Oh, we have to pay the international price. That's a load of bollocks. My feelings with that are closely um, mirrored with the meat. We've got enough lamb and beef wandering around, and yet, strangely enough, we have to pay prices for our lamb that are higher when the exchange rate is taken into account than you can buy it in London. I mean, you know, a block of anchor butter, I've just looked it up on the, on the Woolworths website, a block of anchor butter, 500 grams, really basic anchor butter, $8.50. Who can afford that? Well, you know, well, we have to because, I mean, the alternative is that horrible chemical mess they call margarine. It's yep. ridiculous. $8.50 in a country that's blessed with open pastures and abundant milk and cows, and we're paying through the nose for, for that. Surrounded by a massive ocean, and and fish is exorbitant. I don't know how the Catholics get on these days um, with having their fish on Friday. I don't know how anyone gets on. I think the, the, the fish that I can afford to eat is canned tuna and um, Al's bells. You know, even then you have to think about it before you buy it. Yeah, I mean, here we go. Here's five hundred grams which is only, you know, half what you actually need of tasty cheese, $10. That means it's $20 for a kilo. You know, things have got to come to a head, and I'm not exactly sure how all the COVID logistics pricing that forced the price of even the most basic um, goods out of the shopping basket simply because it costs too much to transport it. Well, that's largely over, but the, the prices seem to have stuck around. Yeah, it's 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 bordering on ridiculous. So your gut feel is that the economy is dire, that we've got a massive contraction. People happening. are suffering. People are suffering, yeah. And a, a $4 a, a week um, tax cut or whatever the number was, or some tiny little number, I don't think you can even buy a, a packet of chewing gum for that much. Oh, listen, I, I just laugh at the tax cut. I mean, I didn't see it in my pay packet, and the reality is that a whole lot of people have lost it. You just need to fill up the car these days to actually realise where all your money goes. And, I mean, I'm, I'm shocked at how little money I have left in my wallet at the end of the month, so to speak, after the mortgage is paid. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's 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 not a. I don't think we're in a good spot, and it's uh, it's good to know what the retailers are thinking here. That there are less customers, and the customers you do have are spending less. Yeah, yeah, they've shut their wallets. That's for sure. Okay, Miles, thanks for your feedback on that. Uh, we'll go and see what uh, Lindley has to say, being a pensioner, and see what her thoughts are on the economy. <laughs> hey, have a have a good afternoon, Ken. See you later. Thanks, Miles. Good afternoon, Lily. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Hello, Cam. How are you today? Oh, I'm fantastic always. I'm on air. I'm talking to my buddies. Can't be any better than that, can it? No, it's really great. 
what are we going to talk about? I thought that this week I'd do something different rather than a specific issue. I'm just trying to get a feel from people out there, you know, ordinary Kiwis, how they feel about how the economy is going and what their thoughts are uh, on that situation. Right. Okay. Well, so it's the New Zealand economy. Yeah, the New well, Zealand economy. Is it going great gangbusters or do you think it's struggling? I think it's fibrillating. <laughs> um, but anyway, just hang on a second, Cam, just a second there. Um, I'll just grab my binoculars and I'll have a scout round and see if I can find the New Zealand economy. <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is, a big black hole in the distance in space. I thought you were going to say black it, hole. it looked like a dead cat. What? Feet in the air. <laughs> no, <laughs> but black holes are extremely dense. I'm not thinking of Luxon at all, of course, mm. with such gravitational pull that not even light can escape their grasp. Yeah. That, that, that sounds like the New Zealand economy to me. It's how we see it at the moment, especially that word grasp. And this is the talk of all the people around me at the moment. They're starting to wake up. They're educating themselves and they're looking at who's responsible now. And the New Zealand economy's motto, I think, is grasp while you can. If you can't afford it, grasp some borrowings. If you can't pay that back, grasp some more. And if you can't pay that back, grasp that from your constituents like me. Uh, use them as collateral and grasp even more. And this they call investing. What they don't realise is that uh, the common people are starting to wake up to it. Now, you're a superannuitant. How are you finding things at the shops? Well, uh, you are probably talking to um, the uh, greatest budget saver, probably uh, internationally, <laughs> <laughs> of Scottish descent. <laughs> um, so I can cope, but... Sort of, I can illustrate it quite well going back to the ratepayers, which are the people that are rising up around me at the moment. Yeah. So my modest rates, uh, which I was working out the other day, they have soared from 2021, $48 a month, 2023, $120 a month, 2024, $160 a month. So from 2021 to 24, they've gone up from $48 to $160 a month. And that's with a low-income rebate. How do you think other people are managing? Well, it would be difficult. I mean, you know, I was just talking to Miles and talking about the cost of a very small bag of groceries at the supermarket costing nearly $100. You know, you you actually feel like your wallet is being raped every time you go to Woolworths or Pack and Save or, or New World. It, it's that dramatic. I haven't seen this in a long time, and you know, that's why I thought we'd discuss that, what, you know, what people are seeing, what their friends are saying, what are other observations, where the pain is. What have you seen recently? You've thought, oh, my word, that's eye-watering. Mm. Well, um, shopping, in my opinion, uh, get, you get hold of your trolley nowadays and it's a white-knuckle experience. And it's, it's really the, the government's out-of-control borrowing is the problem. And I, like you, I reckon $100 is the new $10 in value. Mm. And they go on about how inflation is, you know, I don't even know what it is at the moment, but it's only something like 4 point something percent or something. It's absolute nonsense, you know, because when you go around the supermarket, everything that you bought six months ago, anything that was, let's say, uh, $3 is now $4 something. That's my experience. Um, but as I said, I'm extremely crafty with my shopping. I wouldn't buy any of the things that a lot of other people buy. I don't buy those instant sort of, those jars of um, things to spice up your mince recipes and all that sort of stuff. I don't buy any of that, you know, or chips and soft drinks and uh, I don't buy any of that. But, I, well, I mean, I am really an exception because I also put some money into um, a Christmas club at the, at the supermarket every fortnight religiously 
Yep. And then when I get to the end of the year, I can almost go three months without having to dig into anything. I've got the Christmas club money, so that's a tip for other people if they can discipline themselves to do it. But we're also absolutely sick of this uh, woke messaging, um, my friends and I, and it's very hard to escape. And you never believe it, but a friend of mine last week she had the misfortune to be shopping in uh, Woolworths, which she rarely does. I bet this is going to be the same as I heard. Well, we'll see. And, mm. and she got halfway around Woolworths um, when she was bombarded with an intercom advert on a weekly special for menstruators. Mm. Yep, it's exactly the same. When I'm sitting there walking through the supermarket with my trolley and all of a sudden I'm bombarded at, at, at a huge decibel um, level. About, That's what she said. It, was, it wasn't about menstruators. It was about menstruating shoppers or menstruating Kiwis. Oh, well, she, she might have been so shocked she just didn't quite catch it right, but <laughs> it was obviously the same ad, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But she was absolutely furious, um, and, you know, she said she knows she's a woman. She sees one in the mirror every morning. She doesn't want type like this in her shopping experience. Yeah, they should just say that period products um, are on special. We don't need to talk about menstruating Kiwis. We all know they're women, right? Even if they're... Oh, well. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, evidently they're not just women. But they're, um, I know what they mean. I know what they mean. They mean that um, women who have turned themselves into men or think they have... Um, well, they're women with a delusion, they, what it is. Yes, um, well, it's a change from men and frocks anyway. That's bad enough, isn't it? Yeah, we always used to laugh about that. But apparently you're not allowed to do that anymore because it's hate speech. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Everything is hate speech. If we go back to the early days of, of the Ardern regime, you remember, if you remember, she was, you know, came out and said, oh, it's terrible. We've got all these terrible plastic products. We've got plastic bags. Single-use plastic bags. You know, now anyone I know, and you'd be, you're a frugal person, so you would have had supermarket bags, and you would have used them for many, many different things. You know, putting your dirty, yeah. dirty shoes um, in a plastic bag before you get in the car, or you're going around using it to pick up dog poo or whatever. But apparently, these were single-use plastic bags, and the government was really seriously thinking about what they'd do about it. And then all of a sudden, some woke presumably a woman at Woolworths or at um, Pack and Save, they all decided almost like together that we're going to remove all of these useful things from, from us. And now we all had to buy bags when they used to give them away for us. So they, they were just stiffing us all the time. I mean, a dollar fifty for a paper bag that with a slight bit of rain turns into a damp mess and drops everything on the floor is not the same, is it? No, it's not. But those paper bags, um, they're, they're sort of reconstituted, or whatever you'd like to call them, um, and that's why the, the paper itself is just so pathetic, you know. It's, it's probably two, three, four times around the clock, that stuff. Like I can remember when my mother went shopping, we, we bought stuff in, it was put in brown paper bags, but it held good, you know. You yep. didn't have your veggies fall out the bottom of it. <laughs> But uh, yes, well, what I do now is um, wh whatever I buy in plastic bags, which seems to be a lot of the vegetables and things, like um, you get a kilo of carrots or something, they're in a plastic bag. So I save the plastic bag to do what the other plastic bags that they've taken away, uh, I, I use them for in place of those, you know. Yep. So, um, and there seems to be more plastic Everything you pick up just about um, is, is in packaging, and I think that's a real problem, really. Um, I have been out to the Cape Valley um, Waste Management Outfit here, and, you know, they have um, a truck and trailer unit pulls up there every three and a half minutes, and they're those wow. absolutely monstrous trucks. They're monstrous, and that is all bulldozed under the ground, and because you can't see it, well, no, it's not there. No, you can't see anything there. No, but someone um, will dig I don't think in a thousand years and it'll all still be there. Well, that's right. And it's got a leech somewhere, you know? Mm, totally. Doesn't it? 
Is there so, any um, for us, though, Lenny? Can you think, you know, with your frugal mind that, you know, would you like to make some suggestions to Nicola Willis and Christopher Luxon about what could be done? Because it seems they sit there in their ivory towers and their nice shiny leather seats and say that they're working for us, but it doesn't feel like it, does it? No, they're not working to us for us, and that's what I said. People are, you know, like when I go to the cafe now, and and let's say it's a group of women, um, they're not talking about women's things anymore. They're talking about what's going wrong with the economy. They're talking about being flogged with their rates, flogged with the mm. shopping cart, flogged at the petrol pump. You know, um, that's what's going on. They are waking up. And the main thing above all else with the government and the councils is this disease of borrowing. Then they borrow on top of what they've borrowed. They can't pay that back. So then they borrow more just to pay the interest, just to keep it, you know, going and and borrow a bit more so they can then do another grand project as well. And it's just mounting up. I mean, I think the Dunedin Council, I think you know this one, they're paying a million dollars a week in interest on their borrowing. It's it's astonishing. And the councils are, are the very type of bureaucrats that are leading this push for all this woke nonsense, um, you know, with diversity hires and rainbow this and a parade here. And, and the council just willy-nilly spends money on all of this. And at the same time, they say, oh, well, well let's, we, we're a bit short, so let's, um, let's put the rates up again. And, and they don't even well, that's consider exact. To, that they perhaps might need to trim some fat. They're treating us like captive clientele. That's the trouble. And um, you see, in Luxon's uh, comments about his uh, local water done well, what an interesting name that is. Yeah. You know, he goes on about this stuff, about how the ratepayers own the assets, you know. Well, they don't own the assets. That's, that's what people are finding out, that the council are just running rough shot, shot over the top of them and char- charging the ratepayers for their share of the assets, but then the council are doing what they like with the assets and they're not transparent and they tell lies. And I know down here they've already started a hate campaign against the ratepayers. You know, they've started their program in advance. Uh, they had a front page article in the local rag of the mayor standing there and everything and saying that there was this small group of conspiracy theorists um, harassing the council. And this is actually their ratepayers Mm. who have tried to speak to them, who've tried to say, look, we just can't sustain these massive rate increases. What the hell's going on? So so they've got their hate campaign going against these people. They're saying that, um, oh, they've got death threats and everything. But when the rate payers challenge them on that, um, no, they couldn't come up with uh, any specific person or example of anyone who had actually... um, Mm. You know, threatened them. Had they had they put any complaints into the police? Well, no, they haven't. Hadn't. Well, wouldn't you think that if somebody sent you a death threat, you would lodge it with the police? You would, but you know they don't care. They don't care for their ratepayers, and they only care about um, continuing on to spend willy nilly with the ratepayers' cash. And I don't think we're going to have a change about that unless people are prepared to say no. Stop well, I think in these fools that keep spending other people's money because eventually you, you know, Margaret Thatcher was right back in the 80s. She said eventually you run out of other people's money. Yeah, well, I think they're in for a surprise. I know a little bit what's going on behind the scenes. No, oh, well, people wait, are educated wait. and fit. people are about to stand up. They're in for a hell of a shock. No, well, and um, yeah, well, we'll look yeah, for it. Well, I'll be looking forward to it. Um, but I had to laugh in this thing of um, Luxon's when he's going on about the announcing the local water done well thing. And um, I looked at it and I thought, what, what's this thing about a long life asset? And then I thought, it might be me. 
<laughs> I think you're right. Oh, that's a good note to finish on. And Lisa, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Cam. See you. Bye. See you later. Bye bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. Good to have you back. Thank you for having me. I'm just doing something a little different this week with with Cam's Buddies, rather than you know a specific nitty gritty type um, question. I thought I'd ask what your impressions are on how the economy's going, you know, what your friends are talking about, and where is the pain that you think people are experiencing, what you've seen recently, and are you seeing any patterns in this? And just generally look at all of those sorts of things. Yeah, there's two schools of thought here. There was a, a guy who was an ice cream dealer, and he used to sell ice creams on the corner store. Yeah. And um, people asked him, um, oh, what do you think of the terrible economy? And he goes, well, I'm not sure. I just sell ice creams and people buy ice creams and I keep selling them. And I didn't know there was a problem. So even though there was a problem, if you've got something people want and you sell it, people buy it. I'm fortunate I'm in lines of business that if the economy turns down, I do well. And if the economy goes well, I do well also. So I'm feeling... I'm kind of doing okay in many facets of the work that I'm doing. Having said that, I've talked to a few people that are in a more of a, um, a luxury business so that the the things that people buy with their disposable income, if they don't have any disposable income, they don't buy. And so as such, they're feeling a bit of a pinch. On the other hand, I've got a mate who um, bought a commercial building and... Um, he had to settle, and so he decided to sell a couple of units, um, where like residential um, units in Eastern Beach. Yep. And um, uh, I thought the value of them was something in the order of a million. Um, a couple of years ago, he paid eight hundred for them, or some number like that. Yep. And um, he put them out there and got one point one five. And yep. when he was telling me that guys offered me one point. Nine, what should I do? I was thinking in my head, bite his arm off, but because it was his first offer, I said, well, I'm sure the guy's got more in, um, so I just try and get the fees for the real estate agent out of him, and he ended up getting a, another about a hundred grand, and so I'm thinking all these things are pointing that if you've got good product, it still kind of sells. Now, I've got another mate who um, his business is struggling and has been struggling all year, and I'm looking at him and thinking, not really sure that's a great business to be in. But having yeah. said that, he decided to um, sell his hangar because he's got a plane. Mm. And um, he sold his hangar and he put it on the market and it was interest and bought within a few days. Wow. So, again, I thought a hangar was something that was um, an expense that you'd only have if in good times. You know, like yep. um, I've got a hangar myself. And once he sold his plane, he moved into into my hangar. And um, I've got another friend who decided that it might be a good idea to sell his plane so that he, if things had a bit of a downturn, because he was experiencing a bit of a downturn, he's got good staff and he wanted to make sure that he didn't lose any of them. Mm. So he's been paying them regardless of what work he had, and he sold his plane for the ability of doing that. And, and all of these things tell me that some things are tougher, and um, I think the building industry, with the interest rates doing what they're doing, the building industry has now um, taken a bit of a hit, a slowdown. So if you're selling anything that's related to the building industry, I think there's a lot of um, cheap caution there. You know, there's some caution details where people are not getting the, the cash flow that they used to. And if you've got a business that requires a lot of borrowing, Mm. Well, cash is king. So, in some of the building, some of the businesses where, you know, you um, you live on borrowed money, well, and growth, they're a bit tougher at the moment. I think. Yeah. But in the businesses that I'm in, um, they seem to um, do all right. In either side of the street, things are going well. In one part of my business, goes well. If things are going poorly, then another part of my business goes well. So, I'm kind of off plan for it, so that I did that. Deliberately, so that at any given stage of the economy, I've got something that people are wanting. Yeah. So, so would you suggest then maybe if people stop listening to the news and reading, you know, reading uh, web news websites, 
about the economy and get, hearing all the wailing and the people complaining about the economy, that they, they might just go and buy the things that they need when they need them and not worry. Yes, I'm 100% behind that as a, as a concept. I think because the election in the US has caused problems with the Biden regime, because of that, um, world wars, fuel prices have gone up, interest rates have gone up, but we're fearing, feeling the effects of being in a democratic, or the Democrats being the, the, in the government in the US has got a trickle-down effect that it's affecting us badly. If the Republicans were in there, we would be a lot better off. Now, other people will say that that's not correct, but their businesses are the ones that are struggling. Also, if you've actually planned for some of these things, if you plan that I don't want to be geared more than this percentage, I don't want to be in a position where I have to have, like, if no one pays me any more money for another two years, I'll still be fine. And yeah. that's a good position to get yourself into. And um, we're all able to do it. We, we, we Sometimes we our wants outweigh our needs and we make some decisions on want instead of need, in which case, if we hadn't have done that, um, things would be a lot better. But having said that, I still um, do a reasonable amount of consumer spending and I'm getting a few bargains at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I've got a few mates in the car industry and they're telling me things are absolutely dire where they haven't sold cars uh, on on the lot for quite some time. I think you know somebody in the car industry as well that um, things are a little bit slower than they have been, uh, particularly with companies that are rolling over leases um, and rather than getting new vehicles and that, that sort of a thing. And I've always viewed the car industry as a bit of a bellwether in the economy that if people aren't spending money on cars, then things are really tight. Mm. Um, there's a bit of a complex business there because mm. there was waiting lists for Toyotas, for example, yep. and I've got a Toyota on order at the moment, and I haven't been given any indication of when it might be. And because there's less new Toyotas coming in to New Zealand than there has been, and it's because of the waiting list and there's chipsets that are unable to be gotten, so because of the, um, they can't make things, and this is all a bit of a, taking this long, I guess, to have it fully rolled down from when they weren't working during the COVID lockdowns. Some of the countries internationally haven't made um, enough product to fit out some of these cars. Well, when one group of cars stops, then the trade-ins from those stop, and there's quite a lot of industries affected. And then suddenly, not just in the car industry, but in a number of industries, a couple of things line up and there's a few turn down or downturns. Mm. The next thing you know, um, lots of companies out of Fort can't afford to buy um, a new fleet or replace the fleet or whatever. And so um, it, it's a bit interesting. Yeah, I mean, and also the um, the arse has dropped out of electric cars as well um, in a market. I mean, sure, there's people that are out there buying them and that, but, uh, you know, I'm talking to car dealers that um, they've got stock um, that's getting older every day and they can't move it and they don't know what to do. And I know of one large importer of vehicles that is looking at a something like a seventy to eighty million dollar write down on their stock. Yes, I mean the government has unexpected consequences on a lot of the decisions they make. So the this current national government said, "Oh, we're going to put a road user charge on all these electric vehicles." Mm. Well, it makes it not not worthwhile buying an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle with those road user charges. They were they were a win because you were getting to drive a lot of places for not much. But now it's as cheap to use petrol or diesel. And so once it's as cheap to use petrol or diesel, people kind of like the range of petrol or diesel, but if you if you bought yourself a Tesla and the power's 10 bucks a day that you're using, and then you get road user charges on it the same as the diesel, well, now it's as expensive as a petrol car. So it, there's no point in rushing out and getting one, in my view, if it's the same price and you've got limited range. Now, the benefit is whenever you get home and you plug it in, when you leave in the morning, it's full. So that's yeah. quite a it's quite a handy thing to have. And, and I've got electric cars and I've got chargers, but um, 
my missus was saying to me that now that they've just reread the meter, because they've done a whole lot of estimates while I've had electric cars, and they've finally come in and reread the meter, I get a fourteen hundred dollar extra charge for the month mm. for all the catching up of the electric vehicles I've been driving. Well, that'd make um, a start, wouldn't it? If they got a bill like that, you, you, you're probably looking at and going, "Oh, okay, that's a bit unfortunate," but you can pay that. Yeah, I found it amusing actually that it was a surprise <laughs> to my wife because when you add these extra vehicles, if her vehicle and my vehicle and someone other friend that's been stopping with us, when their vehicle is ten bucks a day extra, thirty dollars, it doesn't have to have many days to get to fifteen hundred bucks. No, that's right. I don't know if there's any way out of this other than um, people need to be uh, have less borrowings, I guess, and um, only buy things that they need rather than what they want. And, and New Zealanders tend to well, not like to have to make those choices. Well, I think if everybody was to work hard at their job and do their job well, faithfully and diligently, and so that their employer is getting a good um, amount of work done by every employee, then the risks that they're taking become worthwhile. The next thing you know, the economy is going well again. But if everybody's a little bit on the old, oh, well, I'd rather be working from home than going to work every day. And when I work from home, if I've got to do the laundry, well, I've got to do the laundry. And when the washing machine beeps and says, I've finished the load, well, you've got to, of course, put it out on the line. And um, so lots of these people are saying, oh, yes, I'm working from home flat strap, but they're doing half days. And mm. so that when your output is less, but you're expecting the same pay, um, a lot of this, the, the the economy just is less useful. And when government spending's at an all-time high, and, um, and I'm liking a lot of what they're doing, they're looking at some of these government departments and, and saying, well, we should do this and we should do that. But if when you listen to Elon Musk, the reason why there's inflation is because government, their checks are always on it or their money mm. transfers are always on it, whether they've got the money or not. So if they do a, if, if you work for the government and they get more, bigger and bigger, then they just print money. So everyone else's money is worth less because they've printed it to pay their bills with quantitative easing and all these sorts of things. Mm. And so suddenly, there's inflation on board, and now we've got inflation at 6%, um, or a number like that, or interest rates have just eased to um, a quarter of a percent down to 55 for the um, official cash rate. So that's like a two-edged sword again. So the young people will do better, and the old people will do worse. Because if old people have got money on fixed deposit, and instead of getting 6%, they're now about to get 4%, and they'll be spending less. Yeah. Yeah, and then the young people who've got a mortgage and they're meant to be paying um, 800 a week and it goes down to 600 a week, then they'll spend that 200. So it's all it's all a bit of a fine balance, really. And um, I think if we can get inflation under control, if we can um, get the economy moving just by people working a bit harder rather mm. than talking a bit more. Increased productivity. Yes, these are things that are bound to make things work better. I mean, I'm still eating at restaurants yeah. several times a week, and um, they're not empty. I would have thought no. they'd be empty, but they're not. There's, there's not plenty of people in them. Well, maybe you're just eating at the popular ones. <laughs> well, that could be the case, yes. Could be. All right, Paul, thank you very much for your comments on the economy, and we'll talk again next yeah, week. I'm sorry to have any, any wise wisdom, but um, that, that's all I... Well, no, it's very fascinating. Work hard and be kind to your mother. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks for your call. Thank you. Bye for now. Hey, Jack. Good to have you back. Hey. I was back last week, but you missed me. Ah, oh, well, these things happen. Uh, I thought I'd Later. ask you, uh, I'm asking the buddies this week um, what they think of the state of the economy, what, what they think is uh, what their friends are saying, um, what you're seeing around there. Just, I'm really interested – because I've got a sneaking su suspicion that these, you know, shiny pants uh, politicians on their padded leather seats in their ivory towers have no idea what is going on in the economy. So I just wanted to talk to the buddies about that. So give us your thoughts on that, Jack. Well, first of all, according to Paul, I have no friends. So you've only got my word, none of my friends. Um, <laughs> secondly, I mean, 
The economy's been going downhill ever since the Labor Party cancelled all the, you know, the mining and offshore development stuff. You know, mm. we're thinking um, in grandiose thoughts that we didn't need it. Well, we damn well do. Uh, meanwhile, in the background, you've got another born-again Christian, uh, uh, unfun-loving person by the name of Stephen Tyndall, who set up all these warehouses and ruined all the little businesses in all the small towns around New Zealand. You had, um, from my um, photographic industry background, you had Harvey Norman coming in, selling photographs that uh, half the cost just to get people into the stores and ruining the photographic industry. That put 600 businesses out of business because of that. Wow. Um, and now you've got another born again Christian, you know, non drinking, I can't have any fun, so neither are you having any fun, uh, person who just spells out doom and gloom, surrounded by his finance minister with the same story. I hope he was listening to uh, Joe Biden's speech uh, today at the uh, Democrat inaugural uh, meeting. You know, we need someone that can get up there and fire a bit of passion up rather than saying, oh, you know, you've got to tighten your belt, you know, things are going to be tough. We need a bit of rah-rah out there to, you know, drive people along. We we hinge on all of these words, you know, and we've got this doom and gloom merchant leading us, all words about what he's going to do, well, let's see. But um, we're not allowed to have any fun. And when you're not having any fun, guess what? You don't get to do anything. Anyway, that's just my thought. <laughs> well, you know, that's the one thing I like about you, Jack. Um, you know, I, I, I'd call you my friend, so maybe you have got one. But um, what's what I like about well, just you, you Kim. <laughs> yeah. um, there's all the other guys at lunch, but the thing is here, Jack, is you never, you're like me, you just tell people how you think, and, and you know, in your case, mostly you're wrong, but, um, you know, you, do, you don't care. This is what you think, and you tell everybody, and I think we need more people to say the things that are bugging them, so then maybe the politicians will actually listen. But the, tr the thing that I see is New Zealand is so laid back, they're horizontal, and they sort of just shrug, oh, okay. You know, our rates are going up 10%. Oh, okay. Um, groceries are, are $200 yeah. for a very small bag. Oh, okay. Well, nobody actually marches in the streets demanding action. You know, and that's the one thing the French... Hey. Actually do well, you know. They I'll do tell you what, really, really well. I tell you what, you know, talking about, well, as, as I was talking about, Stephen Tyndall. Yeah. My mother was his personal secretary um, way back when he was at George Court. Thought he was a wonderful man. I said, "Mother, don't be so stupid." But anyway, that's another story, <laughs> you know. But um, um, we he, here he is. He's been flogging off cheap Chinese rubbish, and now his cat has come up and. Um, because now we've got this company, Timu, that basically are undercutting him. So what goes around comes around. Yeah, Timu and, and uh, we sold make, out. Make now, here's, the, here's, here's the interesting bit. Yeah. Now, my son's a manager at a New World supermarket, and yeah. um, I see him every week. And I said to him a couple of weeks ago, I said, oh, you're still getting those people running out with, um, you know, trolleys full of rubbish and not paying. He said, yes. And I said... Who, who are the, by race, who are the biggest perpetrators? Now, this shocked me. And he said, Asians. I went, really? Wow. He said, yeah. And, yeah. And anyway, that was two weeks ago. Then on this Sunday, he came back for dinner again, as he tends to do, to get a decent meal in the day. And I said, oh, you said Asians before. And I got to thinking about that. And Asians is pretty sort of widespread. What sort of Asians? Where are you from? He said Chinese. He said right. they're the biggest thieves of the lot. He wow. said, and I was absolutely um, gobsmacked hearing that. Now, that's only one new world, um, but and I don't know whether it's, you know. Well, it could be the location. Okay. Yeah, but so I would have thought they would have been the most honest people around, but not so. Oh, I've found in my experience, Jack, that um, honesty is a scarce resource. And it doesn't matter which race or um, colour or type of person it is. Some people are dishonest and some people aren't. And unfortunately, what we've got in yep. New Zealand is I think we actually have more dishonest people than honest people. I tend to believe you, Cam, unfortunately. Damn. Well, we're not going to solve any of these problems, Jack, this week, but um, maybe we'll try next week. Okay. <laughs>
All right. Nice talking to you. Good talking to you too. Thanks. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Good to have you back. G'day, Cameron. How are you today, mate? It's a beautiful oh, good. day. All good, mate. All good. How are you, Jimmy? I'm very good, mate. Now, what's what's the topic this week, Cam? I just you want me to rave about. I, I want your impressions, and and tell me what your friends are thinking. Tell me about what you think is the problem. How do you think we can solve it? How do you think the economy is going from a man on the street with a couple of kids? I think the economy is dire, and it's more dire than 2010. Wow. I, I personally haven't seen the economy this bad. I'm in construction, and I know so many tradies with no work whatsoever. You know, they've been busy for 10 years, and they've got no work. We've had um, tradies ringing the office who we haven't dealt with for over 10 years ringing us. You know, they're just going through their phone, mm. trying anyone. But in saying that, ever since we've had the interest rate drop last week, there has been a little bit more sort of positivity. Well, that's interesting. So I think that because prior to the interest rate drop, it was just so when people have just got no money, the mortgage rate's too high, or people just aren't buying. Like houses just aren't selling at all. The people build a whole bunch of new houses, just can't sell them. But I actually was speaking to someone today who said that the houses have started moving a little bit, but still very low prices. But at least it's um, there's a few sales, so it may be the start. You know, we may have just gone through the the low, and if interest rates come down more towards Christmas, you may see a bit more positivity, hopefully. But yeah, so as as of now, I mean, you just go past restaurants or whatever; they're all empty. There's just just no money being spent. People are tight. That's my take. Yeah, that's Terrible. that's what I'm hearing from in the car industry and and a couple of mates that uh, have been property developers that are now just sitting on what they've got and holding on for dear life. Uh, you know, there, I know of a few uh, big planned uh, developments that have just been shelved, and that credit for car dealers and credit for people in the construction industry is non-existent. No, that's true. And that's why there's just no work. I mean, someone told me that Auckland Council is 40% down on building consents. So, you know, that means the workforce, the construction workforce has a lot more ability than consents that have been um, granted. So it's unavoidable that tradies are out of work. And I, I don't know how they pay, what they're doing, but the, I certainly know that the IRD is having massive problems with the construction industry with people not being able to pay their provisional tax because they've had pretty good years the previous few years, and so their provisional tax is high, and yep. they've got no work to suck through. So it's, it's a real big problem. But I think if interest rates come down and we come into summer and you know we start seeing a few positive growth, it, it should be okay. You know, by this time next year, it might be quite positive, but. As of today, it's very negative. You wouldn't want to be selling a whole bunch of houses in this environment. There's just no oh, buyers. You think there's a few haircuts? No cut buyers are prepared to pay. What's that? Do you think there's a few haircuts happening? Oh, yeah, heaps. I heard of someone making a $700,000 loss the other day because they Ouch. just couldn't sell. Well, the apartment that they I live in. a property and, yeah. yeah. The apartment I live in, that was a re- six months ago, they put it on the market, right? I'm still in the apartment. They put it on the market for yeah. 1.2 million, and now they're begging for offers around 700 thousand. Oh my god! It's, it's no one comes to the open homes, and I get maybe one person a week comes through. So I think that things are far more dire than either the government or commentators are letting on, or the Reserve Bank. I mean, inflation must be dead. Just in this inflation, it's just it's, it's got to be dead. You just, mm. What? Groceries have got a lot cheaper, right? It just feels cheaper shopping than it did. Groceries are exorbitant. You know, eight dollars for a block of butter. This is nuts. Twenty dollars oh, for a block it's, of no, meat. It's, it's, I still agree. It's completely too expensive. But there was a while there where it was just crazy. You know, like mm. particularly after the cyclone last year. But now I just feel like it's it's, it's balanced off a bit, and, and officially, meat and vegetables have fallen in price. And then the positive thing is that land prices have come back a lot. So, you know, and also the construction costs have fallen seven percent officially. So, once it, people become positive again, it will come away really fast because you know there is some really good buys. 
reasonable. Yeah. Well, let's but hope so. As of now, you cannot build a house for cheaper than it's worth, so you can't make a profit. That's that's ouchies. That's ouchies. Yes. That, well, that's why no one's building, and therefore tradies have got no work, and tradies aren't spending, and tradies don't buy new utes. And that's why we need to get rid of some regulations. No, over regulation, health and safety, all these things are dragging, uh, dragging prices up. And we, we never used to have those problems before, and we've gone overboard on all this stuff, and they're just stupid costs that everybody has to pay, and then we suffer when everything slows down because you can't, if you can't make money building houses, you stop building houses, don't you? Yeah, and lack of housing supply is a terrible thing for a country importing this many, you know, this level of immigration, to, you know. Maybe we need to shut the doors. Or address the problems in the economy so we don't need to import so many. Um, you know, so we have a more honest conversation about what props are our economy. Well, you know, I'm I, sure that um, that Christopher Luxon, who listens to John Key rather too much for my liking, um, will shut the doors on immigration, although Winston might. But um, we're not seeing any evidence of that. But um, I guess we just have to hope that, that these guys know what they're doing. And sadly, I haven't seen any evidence of that yet. <laughs> Oh, we'll never be happy, mate. We're just a couple of moaners. A couple of moaners. Oh, well, we can moan next week, Jimmy. We'll get you back on and we'll moan about something else. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, mate. Yes. As usual, it's always interesting to see what the person on the street thinks rather than the politicians. And today was no different. And this is the sort of stuff that politicians and bureaucrats don't see from their state funded salubrious offices in the Beltway of Wellington. They really should get out more, and perhaps they should call Cam's buddies and get some real truth. Tell us your thoughts on this topic by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you, so connect with us today.